2012 and decided I want to go all in on one board. I've served on around 20 boards over the past 50 years. And Sarah and said I wanted to be on her board. And about a year later, they took a big risk and made me board chair. And then I asked somebody else, Rodney Foxworth, who's like a direct contrast to me, was to co-chair. And that's kind of the short intro at this point. We're, well, one real quick thing, actually. Right now, Rodney and I are sitting down one by one with each board member having either breakfast or lunch and finding out how things are working for them, what their suggestions are, et cetera. Thanks, Jan. Uh, we'll get more into kind of Jan's role and how our board functions. But uh, my name is Sarah Heminger. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Thread. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time explaining what Thread does, but I do think a little bit of context would be helpful in terms of why we've made some of the strategic decisions about our board that we have. I think you'll find that as we start to delve into this, our board is very unusual in a number of respects, um, uh, which carries with it positives and negatives. So just very quickly, um, our founding. So our, our, our organization was founded. My background is as a neuroscientist. I was doing a PhD at Hopkins when, when I founded Thread with my husband. And Thread was founded under some very unusual circumstances. So I had grown up in Indiana, um, in a very religious family. At one point, my parents had found out that um, the pastor of the church we went to had been stealing money. And when my father revealed that, what ended up happening is that from the time I was eight to the time I was 16, um, basically everyone in the church shunned us. So other children couldn't speak to me, other adults couldn't speak to me. And so when I found myself at Hopkins for grad school, I'm a severe introvert, so I didn't really have a lot of friends. I didn't have any family in the area. Um, and it's a really competitive kind of cutthroat environment, and I didn't really know how to find a community. And I was really miserable, and I couldn't really articulate to you at the time you know, why I was miserable. But in retrospect, it was pretty obvious now. I was just like really lonely and pretty isolated. And so I was looking for a way to connect with other people. The way in which I ended up connecting with other people had to do with um, kind of another aspect of my upbringing, which is during high school, my best friend, um, you know, his parents had a very difficult situation. So his mom was in a car accident. She was temporarily paralyzed. She couldn't walk. She couldn't work. She ended up losing um, their home, uh, lost her job. They moved from suburban Indianapolis into public housing. As a result, this all coincided with his transition into high school. So he ended up failing um, all of his freshman year of high school and um, was going to drop out. And at the time, there was this group of teachers who were like, we're just not going to let this happen. So they did everything from pick him up for school, give him rides, make sure he had breakfast, clothes, um, all of those things. And they really formed an extended family when he didn't. Uh, you know, when his family was in crisis. So I thought he was pretty amazing. Um, and because of it, he went from straight F's to straight A's, ended up going to the Naval Academy. It took me a long time, but I eventually convinced him to date me and then marry me. And we've now been, I don't know, 18 years, something like that. <laughs> Some long, really long time. Um, so I say all that because, you know, the way in which Thread was founded is I was desperately searching for something and desperately searching for a way to connect with other people. And because of my husband's experience, um, I just thought, oh, you know, as I was driving past the high school, there must be other kids in that school that are exactly like my husband. I knew nothing about school system, knew nothing about Baltimore City. I didn't even know what a 501c3 was at the time. Um, but I just assumed that every single student who was failing out could go to the Naval Academy because in my mind, if Ryan had done it, anyone could do it. And so the reason that's important to see what the heck does that have to do with board development, it has everything to do with board development because the ethos of Thread is really that um, we're trying to redefine really what poverty is. So instead of thinking of it as we have a group of haves and a group of have-nots, a group of people who um, are saviors and then a group that need to be saved, Instead, thinking about it is that when you don't have um, 
an integrated community where people are coming together and forming mutually beneficial relationships, it actually hurts everybody. Um, this has been shown in a number of studies ranging from, um, I don't know if anyone on the call is familiar with Sean Stafford's work out of Harvard, but they went and looked at you know, the difference between Youngstown and Allentown after they both had lost the steel industry. Demographically, they were almost identical, but they were having radically different outcomes in terms of education, um, crime, public health, and the economy. And what they found was, the reason why was very simple, in Youngstown, where things were kind of a hot mess, Casey, we might um, bowl together, and we worked at the factory together, and we went to church together. But in Allentown, where things were thriving, Casey, we might bowl together, and Imran, we went to church together, and Cindy, um, we worked at the factory together. So it was the diversity in the networks in those cities that actually drove better collective outcomes. Um, the same is true for individual health. So again, another study out of Harvard looking at um, what drives um, health for this group of men. Uh, they, they followed them from their early 20s into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And they thought it would be things like educational attainment or race. It turns out it wasn't any of those things. It was just simply the quality of their relationships. So not how many relationships did they have, not how many friends on Facebook, but did they have a core group of two to three people throughout their life? That core group could change, but at every point in time, did they have a core group of two to three people who they thought had their back? Those that did actually had lower rates of dementia, cancer, heart disease, I mean, like, core fundamental health things directly related to the quality of relationships. So that's kind of in a nutshell, like why Fred does what it does. And the way that connects to our board is that in Fred, we actually have four different curriculums. So we have a student curriculum, a volunteer curriculum, a collaborator curriculum, and a uh, staff curriculum, sorry, five curriculums, including the board. Curriculum. So let me try to pull up here. So all of these curriculum are about each of those individuals going on their own journey of personal growth. So it's not about what we found is when we ask our older students, so we're 13 years old now. Um, so students come into thread as high school freshmen. They're the most academically underperforming, just like my husband was. They stay with us for 10 years for so the rest of high school and six years after. Um, and when we asked students who are alumni who had stayed with us for a decade, like, what was it that made you change? They said, well, quite frankly, you were a hot mess. Like, you were, you know, you were struggling in grad school. You weren't paying attention to your husband because you were working too much. But we watched you fall down, get back up, fall down, get back up, fall down, get back up. And they're like, and we realized there was kind of something to that. What they were really saying was that I was vulnerable and that I allowed them to see the messiness in my life. And didn't kind of package things as this perfectly uh, well-oiled machine, you know, instead let them see the messiness in my life and that that gave them the confidence to kind of address the messiness in theirs. And so that, like the things, all the things I just told you about kind of our founding um, and also what we've known to bring about the real success with our students is also what drives the board curriculum. So let me see if I can pull up Can you see? Thanks. <laughs> the thumbs up is helpful. So this is Kendall, Tynesha, and Derek. Um, actually, Derek is the uh, one who, when we we he actually initiated this somewhat anthropological dig into thread about like why it was that they were thriving. Um, again, just to give you a little context, even with. The average incoming GPA of, for example, our most recent cohort was 0.17 on a 4.0 scale. Um, we've retained 100% of the students we've ever enrolled, and then 91% have graduated from high school. 86% of our alumni, so the three students you're looking at right there, have finished a four- or two-year college degree or certification program. So what we know is that when the adults focus on their own personal growth and their own personal journey, so if we're telling a student to go to school and we want them to be responsible, then the adults need to be responsible and go to school, uh, go to pick the kid up for school if they say they're going to. So that also translates to the board journey. So just kind of moving um, along. 
So when thinking about Thread's journey, um, this is just to give you a sense of the overall curriculum. And I'm hoping to not talk for too long, that way we can jump into more of a discussion. Um, so this aware, commit, engage, and grow are the four stages of all five of our curriculum. So same five stages if you're a student in Thread, if you're a volunteer in Thread, if you're a collaborator, a staff member, or a board member. So it's first really understanding, like, what am I called to do? Um, and the key takeaway really being that this opportunity, if you're a board member, isn't about the board, it's not about fundraising, it's not about strategic governance, it's actually about my growth as a leader. Why? Because we know if the board members are growing and changing and evolving, that that's going to translate to a cultural congruence that allows our staff to change and grow and evolve, that leads to a cultural congruence that allows our volunteers to do that, which then leads to our students doing that. Um, and so that's key, key, key when thinking about our board member journey is making sure that every member of our board actually has a desire to grow and change. If they're here just to like impart their like wonderful wisdom, it's not a good match for thread. We certainly want their wonderful wisdom, but there has to be an openness to their own personal path as well. Um, and then understanding kind of in the commit phase of board development, like what is the shared purpose that all board members have, which is to support the board, CEO, the executive team, and, and to really be there for one another and the organization. Then engagement. So what are the challenges that they're going to take on together? And this is where, again, we'll, we can dive into a bit more detail. But it really is about can they exemplify the core competencies of threat? So our four core competencies are never giving up, failing successfully, so rapidly prototyping, rethinking wealth, not as money, but thinking about it as relationships, and then inclusive decision making. So, you know, when you're um, a board member, for example, what, how might rethink wealth change your engagement? Well, your focus may not be so much on fundraising, but instead on how can I make an introduction for a member of the executive team to someone that I work closely with who could potentially find employment for a huge cadre of thread students, right? So really thinking about the relationship is the key thing and not um, money. And then grow, so looking at what has changed as a result. Everyone on the board should be heading in a direction where we're wanting to build um, really a diverse, inclusive, and equitable community in Baltimore. So this is just like a quick and dirty overview of the stages of any individual's journey, not just a board member in Thread. So important to this though is, again, diving a little bit deeper. And if anyone wants to jump in with questions, please feel free to just interrupt me um, as I'm going through this and we can hop back and forth if that's helpful. And you can also use the chat. So if you're not sure you wanna interrupt, but we wanna start collecting questions or what's really um, coming off the page for folks, that's a place where you can share. Great. Um, so again, now thinking about like, what does this aware phase look like? And obviously this is just a really high level sweep of our curriculum for board members. But first being aware. So you might think, well, that's very simple to get someone aware about your organization, but really thinking about like, what are the things that might be preconceived notions that are wrong and that if not understood correctly could actually be really destructive? So for example, in our case, if you have someone who does buy into this concept of a group of saviors and a group of people that need to be saved, <laughs> and they think that Thread is a traditional mentoring program of people kind of swooping in to save kids, that would be like a really big mismatch with what we're actually trying to do. Um, so making sure they really are aware of what threads like overall short and long-term agenda is and are both bought into our mission, but also our vision. Understanding their own story and their own purpose. So self-awareness, like a board member who really understands um, who they are and like what it is they bring to the table. So. You know, one thing I've noticed that is consistent, our board is extraordinarily diverse. So 
Um, we're over half women. Um, we're over, I think, 68% people of color. Um, we're very age diverse. Our youngest member is 27. Our oldest is 71, so almost. <laughs> um, and we're also sector diverse. So we've, you know, and I think probably the most unusual diversity we have um, is class diversity on our board. So because it is not a fundraising board and we think of wealth as relationships, we need all of our board members to have access to deep networks and be able to influence those networks, but those networks don't necessarily have to be tied to funding. They have to be tied to some sort of resource, but not necessarily monetary. Um, thinking about money is the only resource. So um, one thing that's been interesting is even though the board's really diverse, the one thing that I've noticed all board members in Thread have in common, I don't even know if we've ever talked about this, but everyone on our board has suffered um, a pretty severe trauma. Um, and I found this out, you know, anecdotally, just getting to know our board members over time, but I think it's pretty interesting overlap in that you have such a diverse group of people. I think what that really means is that our board is full of people who have the ability, they, they've lived difficult things themselves and they have the ability to empathize and while their experiences may not be exactly the same as our students or our volunteers, the feelings that come from those experiences overlap and they're able to find that, that point of overlap. And then also understanding their skills, so just very tangibly, what skill set do they bring to the board that could be an asset? Um, and so that's rolled out by working with um, existing board members. So we have a very extensive onboarding process. We usually date potential board members, I would say for up to a, a year to two years usually. So it's very rare that someone would come on our board um, like quickly. It's highly unusual. And as Jan mentioned, he actually asks to be on our board. So oftentimes um, what we're, we'll court people, I was certainly courting Jan, but we want to see the initiative really come from them because when you think about like as a CEO, I don't want to be pinging board members all day to do stuff. What I want is them pinging me with with um, ways in which they can help, which is definitely exactly what Jan does. Um, so that's kind of our aware phase, and so that that phase can take, like I said, anywhere from a year to two years, um, and involves a lot of due diligence. Baltimore is a really small town, and our board is all Baltimore based, so. Also, making sure we talk to a lot of different people who know potential board members who sat on boards with them, um, having potential board members spend time with our students, our volunteers, our staff, so we really know what we're getting into. Part of that, and I don't have a slide to show this to you, but part of that is we are a small board, so we have 13 members and we run it very much like a for-profit board. So we have a board scorecard. That board scorecard is derived from our staff scorecard. Those have very concrete outcomes that we measure on a quarterly basis and then report out to the board. Um, so when you have a small board of 13 people that really are focused on strategy, governance, and relationship building, um, if you have one bad apple, it really could make for a toxic environment. So we're just very careful about um, that process and making sure that they're really interested in kind of an unusual approach to what a, a, I think a nonprofit board looks like. I'm going to pause. Are there any questions there on kind of the aware phase? Okay. Um, so then moving on to commit understanding what our shared purpose is. So in order for people to go through this personal journey, it's not something we can, any of us can obviously do alone. It's very difficult to change and grow, like if we're really talking about that in like a deep and meaningful way. So Thread's model is really structured in a way to allow for that. So you can think of it as like a coach or a Sherpa. So in Thread, you have a student the student has up to five volunteers. Those five volunteers do anything that you would do for your own child. Pack their lunch, give them a ride to school, provide tutoring. The craziest thing we ever did was we had an undocumented student who was um, kidnapped by an undocumented relative back to Mexico. Sorry, the student was an undocumented, the relative was. 
the student got themselves back across the border and we flew to Arizona where we picked them up. So again, if you think about like, if your child was kidnapped by a relative, would you go to Arizona to pick them up? Probably. Would your traditional tutoring program do that? Not so much. So um, what's key though is for those five volunteers, they have a Sherpa or a coach called the head of family. And the head of family's only job is to actually focus on the growth and the development of the five volunteers. It's not to focus on the student. So then you have another layer of volunteer leader and thread. And again, I promise this relates to the board uh, called the grandparents. So grandparents manage heads of family, heads of family manage volunteers, volunteers work with students. So that model of you know, the grandparent's job is really just to ensure the emotional and health, emotional well-being and health of the head of families. That exact same model is then um, what we do at the board level. So Jan and Rodney are like the grandparents of the board, basically. And their job is really to ensure the health and well-being, be the Sherpas, be the coaches, for the committee chairs. So we have four committees on our board. We have a um, nominations committee, an executive committee, resource committee, and finance committee. Uh, and so Jan and Rodney really are the grandparents that are then supporting what are our equivalent, our heads of families that are the committee chairs. Those committee chairs then work with, again, the members of the board on their committee to ensure that not only the projects get done or the things that we're trying to put in process, but that actually those individuals are growing and changing. This is so important for us that we have this congruence both at, with the board and with what's happening on the ground. Because then what happens is when a board member intersect, interacts with a student or interacts with a volunteer and can talk about their role on the board, they can talk about the journey that they've been on, they can talk about the changes in their life, that really allows there to be confidence about the authenticity of the movement that we're really building. If we were to have an incongruence at the board level where you've got all this personal growth and people changing and like all that happening with the students and volunteers and staff and then the board is functioning in a transactional way, it would potentially completely destroy our culture and our culture really is what has made it so that we've achieved such strong student outcomes um, and built such a tight-knit community. Uh, so that's kind of what happens in the commit phase. During that onboarding process, we go through the handbook, um, which is extensive. It's usually, I think, like a half day onboarding. But as part of that, they select, board members select which committee they're going to serve on um, and kind of figure out who their head of family is going to be, who their coach and Sherpa is. Um, and then in the engage phase, it's you're now sitting on a committee, you have a defined role, you have an understanding of like what your personal journey has been to date and why the heck you're on our board. Um, and then it's really about figuring out how to grow their leadership, um, thinking through ways in which um, to kind of connect them with work and thread that actually allows them to fully, um, you know, whatever challenges are going on in their own personal life, it's, it's connecting them to things in thread that naturally reinforce um, naturally reinforce some of those changes that might be going on and support them through them. Sorry, it just I paused for a minute because I literally just today was talking to a board member about their child just getting out of the hospital, and it's like you know, so that's the kind of thing that it's equally important that I'm talking to this person about work that's happening on the board and also like how is their child doing and um, and what does that mean for them and their family? And then the last thing is grow. So really celebrating milestones, both of Thread's growth, the board's growth, the committee's growth, but also of the individual's growth. So one of our board members is having a huge promotion coming up. So we do a lot of different things to celebrate this. We have a weekly board email that goes out that celebrates kind of um, accomplishments. We share press and different things like that. And then we also talk about like upcoming meetings and dates and logistics are in that email, but it's also one way that we celebrate milestones. 
it's something we're working to do kind of more of at the um, board meetings. We tend to be a little bit business oriented actually in the meetings, um, but thinking about ways to celebrate milestones there. Um, so just quickly, like thinking about when you're recruiting um, a board member, the objective really is to find someone who is interested in creating this diverse community. Um, risks are that the person doesn't really equate their own leadership development to being a core factor in dread success. If they dissociate those things, that's a real risk for us. Um, ways to mitigate that on our end are just really being clear about who Thread is, what we're trying to accomplish, um, some of our roles. And then again, we center the recruitment around the individual's personal narratives. So what is it that has happened in their life up until this point that makes it so that um, being on Thread's board is kind of being part of their dots. So this is something we took away from actually the Shoka Future Forum, I think three years ago. Um, out of a Stanford study, they had had a Venn diagram with three circles. So, you know, the passion, skills, and what the world needs. And then we nicknamed that internally, that intersection of those three things being on your dot. So really understanding for board members, like what are they passionate about? What are their skills? And how does that fit with thread needs? Um, we oftentimes meet people that fit two of the three where they have incredible passion, incredible skills, but it just doesn't fit a need thread has. In the past, we've kind of made this mistake of bringing those people on the board, and that really does not work. <laughs> um, it's critical to have all three, all three be there. And then um, we have different activities we do. Um, so we have a quarterly board meeting, and then we also uh, have a board retreat each year where we focus on um, reflection. So the board does a 360 degree evaluation. Um, so again, to think about like how is the board behaving in a way that's congruent with the rest of the organization so there aren't inconsistencies um, in uh, the way that the board is functioning and the way that the rest of the organization is functioning. Let me pause there for questions. Yeah, sir. Yeah, let, and let's just, yeah, let's, um, I'm going to turn off the, um, our video, I think. <laughs>